Welcome everyone to Give God 90 Radio On Demand. My name is Sherry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. Thank you for joining me for just a little while as we look into something that you may recognize, may not recognize, might not even care about. But this time of year, there's always this debate about Christmas and whether we have nativities and that kind of thing. Well, I'm going to look at it from a different angle today. And I'm going to hopefully be able to explain to you not who's right, not who's wrong, but why this debate occurs, okay? And there's more to it. There's more to it than what you might think, all right? But first, let me say thank you to everyone who has uh, been listening for the time that we have been putting these podcasts out. I want to say thank you to the people who are new and checking us out, an ever-growing audience all the time. Um, don't forget, even though on Mondays this is pre-recorded, you can still leave comments. Uh, it's just that I don't get to them, uh, until I get a notice that somebody's left me a comment. You can still hit the like button, the share button, all that kind of good stuff out there. Keep this stuff going out, especially, uh, because, you know, that's how we grow. That's how we, we include people. We want people to, to be involved in the conversation, We want my agenda, I put this out there up front all the time, my agenda and my only agenda, other than hopefully being able to survive, is to convince people to live the way your creator designed you to live. It's that simple. That's what I'm trying to, 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 that's my message. Live the way you're designed to live. Okay, if you don't want to, and it's working, more power to you. But if What you're doing isn't working. Try it the way your your creator designed you to live. Now, there is a website, givegodnani.com. It gives you a little bit of help with that. It takes you step by step, helps you turn your life into a direction uh, that you are designed to live. It's it's that easy. Little bit by little bit by little bit, you get to go uh, day by day by day by week by week by week. And at 90 days, you should see. Now, this isn't goal-oriented. Okay, it's not like you're going to have $90,000 in 90 days. No, that's not. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is your life should improve. And many, many, many people see it improve before, get this, before the first week is out. Okay, they see a change before the first week is up. So hopefully uh, you can spread this out and have people go there and, 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 you know, improve their lives and the lives of the people that they are involved with. One of the things I want to mention is if you go to Give Not God 90 on the more page, there is now uh, several links there. One of those links is for a place called Zero Shoes. No, I'm not in directly involved with that. I'm not a shoe salesman. Don't, don't, you know, even go there. But I want to let you know that the reason it's there is we are part of their uh, affiliate program. If you enter through that, if you click on that button and you go into their site and you actually buy a pair of shoes, we get a little portion uh, to say thank you to us for, for for providing that link, really, is what it's for, and for telling you about this company. And the reason that I chose this company uh, is twofold. One is they get back to very, very basic uh, type of shoe. It's um, as close to barefoot as possible, which is the way we are designed by our creator to walk. And that's the big, big reason that I like these shoes. Uh, my wife, who works in a hospital and walks uh, during a 12-hour shift between 5 and 7 miles every time she works, three days a week, Okay, because she works 12 hour shifts, Uh, used to experience foot pain, leg pain, back pain. Since wearing these, she doesn't have that. And she has worn some very, very, very expensive shoes. Now, these aren't cheap, but they are also not, um, you know, like the the high, high, high end uh, support type shoe. This gets you back to being as close to. Uh, the way that you know the Creator designed you to walk is possible, all right, while giving you the protection you need uh, in, you know, either uh, an outdoor environment, hospital environment, that whatever it is, that's what you're going to find with these shoes. 
Now, as we continue going with what I want to talk about today, um, if you've read my first book, Tradition of Truth, you'll know that in there I, I talk about how I grew up and, and had all of the, the traditional Christian holidays uh, introduced to me at a very young age, like most people do, right? And one of the things that I very early on uh, realized was that Christmas um, was not the birthday of Yeshua, the birthday of Jesus. However, however, most people don't recognize that and, and they still want to celebrate Christmas, even though even though the the every Christian or every Bible encyclopedia, every Bible dictionary, every piece of biblical reference out there will will tell you that Christmas began as a pagan holiday, and well, from from the Holman, um, I'm going to read just a little bit. This comes from the Holman Bible Dictionary. Uh, it's copy, last copyrighted that, well, where this one came from, this particular article came from, was uh, written by Fred Grissom in 1991. And it says, of the major Christian festivals, Christmas is the most recent in origin. Okay? A contradiction of the term Christ's Mass did not come into use until the Middle Ages. In the early centuries, Christians were much more likely to celebrate the day of a person's death than the person's birthday. Isn't that interesting? He goes on to say that very early in its history, the church had an annual observance of the death of Christ and also honored many of the early martyrs on the day of their death. So it wasn't so much the birthday that was important, but the day they died that was more important. Um, he he continues on uh, in the next paragraph. Says for the early part of the in the early part of the fourth century, Christians in Rome began to celebrate the birth of Christ. Now, why would the Christians in Rome celebrate the birth of Christ? Well, they were used to it. They were used to it. They were used to celebrating uh, the winter solstice and the rebirth of the the God of the Sun, S U N not S-O-N, but the sun god Mithra, okay? And because they were celebrating this rebirth, they, Constantine and Eusebius sort of created a hybrid religion. And, you know, I've, I've talked about this often before. And what happened is that, that during the creation of this hybrid religion, uh, the, the, the people of Rome began to celebrate the birth more so than the crucifixion. And Grissom goes on to say, and this is a very interesting sentence because of something we've just found out. The controversy over the nature of Christ, whether he was truly God or created being, led to an increased emphasis on the doctrine of incarnation. The affirmation that the word was made flesh found in John 1.14. Now what's interesting is that this was done in 1991. What we have recently discovered is writings in Hebrew of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And these were preserved through the, the Messianic Jewish communities in Spain Okay, and if you read Jerome's writings, who was uh, an early church father around three twenties when he did most of his writing, Eusebius was about sixty years later, and what we find is a disconnect between the two, because Jerome acknowledges these Jews who were forced into the northern regions of Spain, okay, and they had what is known as the Itala Bible. The majority of it was in Hebrew, including Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and parts of Paul's writings and Revelation. Now that might be a surprise to you. 
but what I want to what I want to emphasize here is John's writing, which was in Greek, okay, doesn't say what it says in your Bible today in John one fourteen. It it doesn't even say in John one one. Today you pick up a Bible and, and any Bible and you look at John uh, chapter one verse one. It says in the beginning was the Word and Word was with God and Word was God. Back in this Itala Bible that was being uh, used up until the near the end of the third century, fourth century. I'm sorry, the fourth century, uh, around 380 when Eusebius got hold of it. If you opened any of those manuscripts and you began to read, what you would find is, in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Son, S-O-N. And the Son was with God, and the Son was God. They actually, um, <laughs> and I have described this this way before, they actually include the Son as part of the Creator as an another characteristic or another aspect of the Creator. And I have said for a long time that the Creator was able to take a little piece of Himself and insert it into His creation. Now that's where I'm going to scare off some of my, my uh, Jewish listeners. But don't be too afraid of this because this is not the first time you've heard that. If you go back and you read Judges very carefully, you will see it. You will see it. If, and, I, and if you read Hebrew, to my Jewish listeners, if you actually read Hebrew, it's, it stands out, okay? It does stand out right there. So, it's not a new concept. Not a new concept at all. However, for the Christian folks, it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem. Now, how does this, with everything I've just told you, why is this changing this argument over Christmas today? <clears throat> All right, here we go. It has to do with something called human conditioning. Uh-oh, he's getting technical here. Don't worry. Human conditioning simply means the way we have been trained. And it, it, it goes from parent to child you know, or teacher to child, or mentor to child, or even mentor to to adult sometime, or teacher to adult sometimes. But it's how we're trained to think about things, and sometimes how we're trained to think about things um, doesn't necessarily equal the way we're we're designed by our Creator to feel about things, right? You know, I can be trained, okay. To be a welder. I can be trained to be a carpenter. But if if that's not what my creator designed me to do. I'm not going to do those things very well. If my creator designs me to be a healer. I'm not going to be able to hurt people very well. Do, do you follow how that goes? If, if my creator designs me to... Uh, you know, bind people's wounds and heal people's wounds and make, make them comfortable in any way, then it's going to go against my characteristic to be able to injure them. It's going to be against my characteristic to be able to say things that will cause them harm. It's going to be against my characteristic to do things either physically or emotionally that would cause someone distress. Does that? I hope that makes sense to you. However, however, to go along with that, today in the United States, we have this debate often about uh, things like, <laughs> you know, should the nativity scene be displayed on public property? Here's a problem that comes up with uh, whether they're atheist, agnostic, self-proclaimed secular, however you want to describe this group. They don't want to give up Christmas. They want the presence. They want that feeling of um, you know, <laughs> peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Okay, Now you can take Santa Claus out of Christmas and it doesn't change anything. 
doesn't change anything. However, if you take the nativity out of Christmas, now you've created a a meaningless holiday in the United States. It's it's empty. If you and, and this might sound a little weird, okay, but there are certain uh, communities which <laughs> atheists introduce, uh, or I should say atheists try to introduce legislation every year that there not be a nativity on public property. And it shows up around uh, the, the first part of November. Okay, that's when they start showing up. Now, why would atheists introduce this legislation? Because they, they, really, they really are the ones who are pushing not an agenda to remove the nativity, but this agenda is sort of self-destructive secular. Because what they're trying to do is say, look, we need to hold on to why we have this holiday. We need to hold on to why we claim this holiday we can't have. And, and it's almost almost reverse psychology, but not really, because there is something ingrained in them that they recognize they need to have a connection to a creator. They, they, they need to have something that reminds them that there is a higher moral standard. This whole peace on earth, goodwill toward men kind of thing that they have been taught and conditioned to believe surrounds this Christmas holiday. Even though we recognize that it had nothing to do with that in the original, um, going back, and I'm not going to go any back further than, than the Greeks, you know, and the Romans around the time of the sun god worship for Mithra. You know, the days started getting longer, and they said, okay, the, the sun god has been reborn, <clears throat> which is where we get the birthday concept from. So they say, all right, we can, we can create this hybrid holiday, right? Now, move forward to 2,000 years, we have been conditioned and trained to believe that something around this time of year gives us this feeling of goodwill, this feeling of helping others, this feeling, especially, especially in the United States when you have our Thanksgiving, okay, and Christmas coming together, and the start of a new year coming together when all things should be, you know, fresh, right? Now, because of this conditioning, we have that for set for this time of year. However, there is a strong desire to connect to some higher moral standard, even among atheists. And I have talked to strong atheists. uh, Well, I shouldn't say they were strong atheists. They were strong atheists 30-some years ago, who today, now today, they are strong Christian people. All right? So we have... What used to be a strong atheist, now today a strong Christian person. I have talked to uh, people who used to be Reformed Jewish, who, you know, and if you're familiar with Reformed Jewish, it, it's kind of a, yeah, I'm Jewish in name only kind of a thing. We're, we're Jewish, but we don't really do all the stuff, unless it's convenient, and then we'll do some of it. They don't really get into the religious aspect of being Jewish, is, is, I guess is a good way to describe that. But I've, I've spoken to those folks who a number of years ago, and now they are more uh, devout, let's just say. They're not completely orthodox, they're not completely anything, but they, they recognize you know, the need for that higher authority. They recognize the need for that higher moral standard. And this time of year, the majority of the world has been conditioned to say there's something about this time of year because we're, we go through this Thanksgiving holiday, it's a time where people are helping people, and it's you know in the northern hemisphere it's cold outside. We need to do something for the unfortunate who you know who may be hel- uh, homeless. They can't get warm, and they're this or that, and people s- somehow forget those things you know around 
you know, the warmer months, right? So we have this human conditioning and teaching that says this time of year is when we should do this. But we have this, this thing in us that is designed in us by our creator that says your spirit is trying to connect. And when your spirit's trying to connect, you will acknowledge things you normally wouldn't acknowledge. I'll, I can guarantee you nobody in September is thinking about a nativity. Except, except a few of the Messianic or the Hebrew roots folks who are actually celebrating the nativity when they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. So you have that group, all right? That's when they do theirs. Now, if, if you wanted to put a nativity scene on public property you know, during that particular time, I don't think anybody would argue. They might throw a little bit of a fit. But the bigger argument would come from the Christians because you're, you're, they're going to be saying, well, you're doing it at the wrong time. But their own literature, their own uh, reference material says, no, that's not quite right. Because um, even in <laughs> even in the the articles and the reference material in the in the biblical dictionaries in the biblical encyclopedias say that Yeshua Jesus was probably born in the fall of the year around the Feast of Tabernacles. So, given their own literature that they're not listening to and not researching. We have this fixation on this argument of Christmas. And what I'm going to say now is probably not going to be popular with anybody. But throughout the recent history, and I I mean from like the 1940s to present, we look at this especially in the United States, and we can say there has been an evolution that has brought this debate. And the evolution that brought this debate was a growing number of agnostic, atheist, and secular who don't understand and and can't fathom why they have such a strong urge to celebrate a religious holiday. Even though they say, even though they say they don't want anything to do with the church, they don't want anything to do with religion, they still, they still think they have to do something for their fellow man. They still are driven by their creator to treat each other, you know, better, I guess is a, is a good way to explain it. But, but they look at people differently. And because they look at people differently this time of year, that comes through what we're trained. That comes through our conditioning. We know we're supposed to do it, but we like to limit it to a certain time of year. Now, actually, we should be doing that year-round, right? We should be treating each other well. We should be helping each other year-round. But because we've been conditioned, we do it in you know November, December. And think we're good for the rest of the year. Now what most people are going to disagree with. Is simply this. Even though. Even though. We have been trained, taught and conditioned. To do this. At a weird time. Our creator can use that. Our creator can use that to glorify himself. Because what it does is it takes people, um, I don't want to say by surprise. It, it, can, it makes people think. And when people think, it's dangerous to a religious establishment. Because they begin to research, and they begin to read, and they begin to look, and they get curious and they say, why is it that I need to do this? And they, and they research things, and they read things written by people like me, or people like Fred Grissom, or people like, I don't know, pick one. Miles Jones is a good one. They read these things 
written by these people who say, no, Christmas, December 25th, is a pagan origin. And they say, yeah, but it's pretty. You, know, you have the lights, you have this. And then they read things that say, wait a minute. Paul wrote in Hebrews that there's these shadow things. Not the real things, but shadows of good things to come. And they say, well, what are these shadows of good things to come? And they, they dig a little deeper and they dig a little deeper. And finally they realize... And the light bulb goes on. I should be doing this all the time. I should be do I should be celebrating my creator all the time. Oh wow, if I'm going to celebrate my creator all the time, the best way to do that is to live the way he designed me to live. And they look and they dig and they study and they read. And the religious establishment hates it. Because now they leave that religious establishment. They're no longer bound by their traditions. They're no longer bound by their, their previous church doctrine. They're no longer bound by these man-made concepts. Now the only thing that they are attached to, the only thing they're attached to, is a need to glorify the one who made them. The one who made everything. The religious establishment hates that. Because now people are thinking, they're reading their Bible, they're studying, and they're saying, how could I not see this? I, I, I've talked to many, many, many people over the last few years who have told me over and over and over again, it's been in front of me all of my life. Why didn't I see it? And the reason you didn't see it is because you weren't ready to see it yet. You weren't ready to see it yet. And it doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're Christian. It doesn't matter if you're agnostic. It doesn't matter if you're atheist. You, know, you need me to keep going down the road here. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you're doing. When you realize... When you realize that your creator has designed you, that's when the light bulb goes off and you say, man, how did I miss this stuff? If I'm supposed to be living this way, how did I miss it? How can I not? How? What happened? And, it, it, and I love the response that people give you know, when they, when they come up, the look on their face is surprised. It, it really, it really, truly, truly is, you know, like they have just opened a treasure box. Because they, they look at me and say, how did I miss this? I, I can't fathom how I missed it. It's been in front of me all this time. But truly, they have seen something. They have seen something. They found something. And that something for them is a treasure. It is a treasure. When you find it, it will be a treasure for you as well. And all, you, all it takes, all it takes is realizing, man, somebody made me for a purpose. Somebody designed me to do something. Somebody put it inside of me so that my spirit has a desire to connect to that spirit and I can be the best person I could ever be. And all it takes, all it takes is living the way you're designed, following the Creator's instructions. The religious establishment doesn't want you to follow the Creator's instructions. They want you to follow their instructions. Your political, governmental establishment doesn't want you to follow your creator's instructions. They want you to follow their rules, regulations, and laws. While as a citizen of a country, you have a responsibility to follow their rules and laws, you have a larger responsibility to follow the creator's instructions and live the way you're designed. 
Sometimes those two things can get along quite well. Sometimes they go against each other. Which one are you going to choose? Don't worry about the uh, secular world saying you can't have a nativity on public property. The discussion about that, the discussion about that is just as important. Just as important. If it wasn't important, they wouldn't bring it up. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, I, I take a lot of heat about not discussing um, Christmas this time of year. Here's my Christmas discussion for those folks who claim that. I've just done it. Now, have a blessed, blessed week.